All right, so if you've been watching Dana White's Contender Series, a whopping nine UFC contracts have been awarded to fighters over the last eight days as we record this. And in many people's eyes, the most impressive performance of all the contract winners belongs to the man joining me on the program right now, Joe Selecki, who submitted James Wallace in the first round of the Contender Series 19 headliner last week in Las Vegas. Welcome to the UFC, Joe Selecki. How are you, man? I'm good, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate you saying that. Uh, yeah, it's been a crazy week in one day. So, yeah, it's been uh, just trying to soak it all in. When I say those words, welcome to the UFC, I know it doesn't have the same, you know, intensity as Dana White saying it, but how sweet is that to hear? No, yeah, I don't think I'll ever get tired of that, you know? And, uh, no, it's sweet to hear from anybody, man. It's been my, my goal since I was, you know, I started training when I was six, so I saw my first UFC at maybe 10. So we'll say since I was 10 years old, so. That's 15 years, 16 years in the making. So, um, no, yeah, it's not, I'm never going to get tired of hearing that. I just want to make sure that I keep hearing that I'm in the UFC and that I, um, you know, just keep everything that got me here and keep working hard and stay here. You know, that's going to be the hardest part. Do you remember which card that was when you were 10 years old? Do you remember which fight really stuck out to you? Yes. Yeah, so, um, the we would go to Blockbuster, you know, like every other family once a week or whatever, and uh, rent a video game and a movie, whatever. And uh, I remember... The first car I saw wasn't like the most recent one. So the first one I saw was a VHS. It was uh, Young Guns. I think it was UFC 18 or 19 with Tito. And I'm only 10. I popped it in because, you know, we were doing jiu-jitsu. So my parents let me rent it. They didn't know. And, uh, man, he puts he uh, he puts Guy Mezger to sleep. He does the finger guns. And he puts up the middle finger. And I'm like, oh, I'm not supposed to be watching this. You know? <laughs> and then the, uh, the, the most recent one to that time that me and my brother rented was a DVD. It was uh, – UFC 46 Supernatural, it was Randy, Vitor, uh, I think there was uh, Matt Serra went against Chiruto, uh, or maybe Frank Trigg, Jeff Kern was on there, just, I remember that one, and uh, and then after that, we ran a UFC 48, and those, man, I was hooked, it was a uh, done deal from that point, Randy, Tito, the whole Chuck, uh, Tito saga, man, couldn't get enough. So you knew after watching those videos and those DVDs that this is what you wanted to do? Yeah, I don't think I thought it was reality because I was so bad at jiu-jitsu. Like, I was uh, – I competed every year, well, once a year or so until I got older. But um, every year from 6 to 16, and I literally – people think I'm joking. I did not win one tournament. You know, I might have won a, a random match here or there, but it was a lot of participation medals, a lot of one and duns, and a lot of long rides back down the uh, Garden State Parkway back home, you know, crying into a milkshake. But – uh it definitely was what I always wanted. I don't know how I thought I, this would ever happen, but it was definitely my dream for sure. After going through all that with the jiu-jitsu tournaments, the first one you won, how sweet did that milkshake taste? Oh, so good, man. Yeah, I mean, uh, gosh, I went to a Naga when I was 15 uh, with my brother, and because I was a teen competing in the adult division, I got to do like the beginner division, you know, because uh, when you bump into adult, you kind of go to a lower bracket than you would be. And... Uh, I mean, in reality, I beat two white belts and have been training for 10 years, you know, but, oh, man, you could have told me anything. I was so excited. <laughs> and, uh, gosh, I think that that was the beginning of everything. My brother took me to the adult day because we couldn't go. It was a two-day tournament. So I had to compete in the adult division. I was, you know, probably just as nervous as I was for last week. And uh, same thing, man. These little things, they just boost you up. And I think that win carried me for the next five years of losing. And, uh, yeah, it just kept me going. So, Everything happens for a reason, and it all just unfolded really funny, but it was worth the 10-year wait to get that first big tournament win. You said something right off the bat when I asked you about the welcome to the UFC question because it's sort of a mixed bag when it comes to, to earning that contract, and what I mean by that is, and you kind of touched on this, obviously it's fantastic. It's huge to have a great performance on the Contender Series and hear Dana White say your name and get a contract, but you know, for a lot of guys and gals that I've talked to, that's just the first step. Like It's wonderful, but until they get in the octagon and get a win for the UFC – it doesn't become real. You know what I mean? Like, do you feel the same way that, you know, this is awesome. I've taken a huge step, but I'm not quite where I'm not quite there yet. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, um, I think there'll be maybe a little less nerves going into the fight. Cause I know it's a UFC fight and at least I will have been there and fighting at the highest level. But here's the thing. Like I went to college, but I didn't finish college. So I don't tell anybody or put on a resume that I went to coastal Carolina cause I didn't finish, you know? And, uh, I think that'd be the same thing as going in the UFC and going like, two and out, you know, losing your first two and getting cut. And that's not something you want to be proud of and talk about. I mean, maybe getting there is an accomplishment in itself. And I think because I went on the contender series and got to win and, you know, got to get that win on TV and 
that's a part of my journey. That's exciting. And that's something I'll be excited to show my grandkids one day, but that's not where the story can end, you know? And, uh, I have to do everything I can to make sure I get to get that win, get to the next level, get through the first contract, get a second, you know? And, um, all this is becoming real now where I can really set up my little family that I'm trying to start. And, uh, you know, it's all, it's all just the beginning. And I really need to remember that is it's like going pro now, you know, when I went pro my first pro fight, I didn't want to, I, I so badly wanted to get that first win. Cause I would not call myself a pro if I went all in one and stopped, you know, um, same thing here. I'm not going to be a UFC veteran if I go all in one in the UFC and they cut me. So, um, I'm just taking that same approach and, uh, I think that's what's gotten me here and it's, what's going to keep me to the next level and the next level and all the way into the top 15 and so on, you know? You mentioned either during the post-fight interview with Laura Sanko or after you got the contract that you fought in front of Dana before, you had a similar submission. I think it was part of the Looking for a Fight series. For those who don't know that story, when did that happen and what was that night like for you knowing that that Dana would be there? Yeah, so um, that was February 2017. So I was not even a pro for six months at that point in time, but that was my third pro fight. Uh, Not as nerve-wracking as the Contender Series or anything because... I know that no matter what I do that night at 155, you're not getting signed at 3-0, you know. So, um, but I knew, I knew that that would be the foundation for the future as far as maybe I could have that in the holster of saying, well, I fought in front of Dana White once, and maybe he would remember if I stood out. Um, yeah, I ended up finishing the guy, I think maybe 90 seconds or so with a rear naked choke, quick back take. Um, and, you know, I took my picture with him afterward, and uh, I was just like, hey, like I fought tonight. I didn't know if you remembered or not. He was like, oh, no, it was fantastic, you know. Get, just get more fights. And I was like, oh, I'm going to. I'm going to. And then, uh, oddly enough, my, my old former boss took a picture with him that night, too, and posted it. It was like, uh, just like his current boss and, and future boss, you know. And uh, but it was just exciting. It was a little boost to be like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to ha- – I'm a big believer in, like, setting goals and, you know, going after them. And having a picture to be like, oh, well, you know, I, said, I posted it that, that next Monday. I was like, I'm going to work for this guy one day. You know, I think if you put stuff out there, you got to go do it. So that was – it was cool, you know, but um, I never made the episode of looking for a fight, even though I had a good submission. Um, they focused on a guy that had ties to some of the guys on the show already and some UFC vets. He was like 0-1, and, and he went to a draw that night, so he was 0-1-1. One, and one. They focused mainly on him, you know, which is kind of weird, but that's how it goes. And uh, and then Jared Gordon from CFFC, who won that night, who's a stud, you know, and he got some well-deserved, uh, well, well-deserved press, too, so... Um, yeah, it was just cool to have gone through that experience. So I had the nerves of Dana being there. and um, I think it kind of helped me with fighting in front of him and McMahon and Sean Shelby. I'm not sure how it works because obviously I'm not a fighter and I'm not fighting on the Contender Series anytime soon. But do you meet with Dana before the fight or is it the first time you see him once you get out there right before you get into the octagon? Yeah, so for our episode, I was kind of wondering the same because, you know, at the UFC, I guess he grabs all the fighters, gives them a big pep talk about how they need to put on a show and yada yada. But um, no, but this week, at least with my week, um, we didn't talk to really anybody like that beforehand, none of the matchmakers or anything like that. Um, when we, were, we were in a really big room waiting to be drug tested, and Bisping walked through a couple times, and all he said was, what's up, guys, and kept walking. But yeah, we didn't sit down with anybody, have any meeting or anything like that, which is good, honestly. Like that first fight, I'd rather just have the jitters of fighting in front of Dana. I don't need the whole pressure <laughs> of talking to him beforehand. Um, and then I didn't get to grab him afterward. I mean, he's a busy guy, man. As soon as he gave the contracts, he was out of there. I think the next night was the SB Awards and stuff. So they're probably headed there. You know, it's a busy guy. I can't even imagine. Just in my little schedule of the last week, which has been not that much, I've done like, I think maybe like eight, you know, interviews like this or like uh, the news came to the gym yesterday. That's been hectic. I couldn't imagine being Dana White or like Conor McGregor. So those guys should get a pass on not being able to spend too much time with one person. You know, uh, they're busy people and they're making the, the fight world go around right now. So it's all good. Yeah. It was interesting though. We didn't see him until afterward. Yeah, I didn't know if he like saw you in the room and pointed you out. And was like, oh yeah, I remember you from from a couple of years ago. But uh, you know, your win a couple of weeks back, eight days ago, was was really impressive for a number of reasons for me because the fact that James Wallace is such a tough in your face guy, he'd never been finished in a fight before. So to go out there and be as dominant as you were, you, you showed a lot with your striking game. I think that threw that, that surprised a lot of people. But obviously, once you got to the ground, you did what you always do. And it was a really special performance, in my opinion. I know, you know, with you guys and gals in the fight game, you are your own worst critics all the time. But you had to have been extremely satisfied with your performance last week, right? Yeah, I mean, there was a couple things that I saw, you know, that I should have done maybe differently. That I got away with, and they worked out for the better. But, um, 
yeah, there was a couple things, but yeah, I was definitely satisfied. Um, and I think knowing, you know, watching that build up to the fight, you know, I, the eye test is something you can always go off of. And when I watched, uh, you know, when I watched James Wallace's videos, like he was a stud, you know, he's submitting people in the first round. And, um, but, you know, I was seeing some things maybe strategically that I was like, well, I think I'm a higher level of grappler than the guys he's faced. So he's submitting a lot of guys off his back or he's, you know, maybe failing a submission. And they're putting themselves back into it. And it's that weird lead up to the fight where you're like, I don't think, I, don't, I know I don't do those things, but maybe he's so good and I'm going to fall into a triangle or maybe his traps are so good. So it is a weird little, um, you know, your mind plays tricks on you going in. But uh, something my, my coach was telling me going in, John Salter, was he's like, anybody that's going to do that to you on the ground and make it a tough night for you and put you in submissions, make you work out, he's like, you already know the names of those people, you know, whether they're in sports, jiu-jitsu, or MMA. And he's like, don't forget that. And uh, that gave me a lot of confidence, you know, and I think – that's something I wouldn't have told myself because I really do see myself differently and I'm really hard on myself. And, uh, but him saying that gave me a big vote of confidence to go out there and take the fight wherever. And I know that, um, you know, even if he was better on the ground, he's not going to do anything I haven't seen. I'll be able to work out of it and either get back to the feet or capitalize on the ground. That's what happened. You know, we got to let it go a little bit early on and then we ended up on the floor. And, uh, I just think that was experience for me. He's been training and fighting a long time, but, I spent a long part of my life just doing jiu-jitsu. So that mixed in with the wrestling and the punches. I think it makes it a little easier sometimes. That's kind of how it went. I was happy. In a lot of ways, I saw a lot of myself in you when you spoke about how supportive your wife has been throughout your career. I mean, personally, I just pivoted to covering MMA on a full-time basis. It's been less than a yeah, month for wow. me. And, um, you know, I'm obviously not 100% in the same boat as you. I'm not getting punched in the face. I'm not putting my body through hell all the time. I didn't do years and years of jiu-jitsu tournaments, winning, losing, going through everything you've gone through. But the grind to, you know, put money in the bank is, is certainly real. And, and my wife basically told me, you know, go get it, make it happen. And that means the world to me. Yeah. I remember Justin Timberlake saying not too long ago when he got one of those, like, celebrity doctorates from Berkeley School of Music, he said something to the effect of find someone who is better than you marry her and then hold on to her forever. And that was yeah. like a quote that really stuck out to me. It sounds to me like you've done exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, and then you said, you know, you're not fighting or anything, but in reality, you know, fighting's a, a parallel for life. It's a, it's a metaphor for life. That's why people love fighting. You know, more people have drawn inspiration from the Rocky movies that aren't fighters than people that are fighters. You know, a lot of fighters look at it and go, that's a cheesy. It's not like fighting, but people, you know, I'm from outside the Philadelphia area and man, you should see people that travel the world to come see the statue at the art museum because they took something from it, whether they finished their degree because of it or they didn't give up at their job, whatever it is. So, you know, fighting is not any tougher. Or, you know, you write and I fight and, and writing probably is just difficult for you as fighting is for me because it's what we do, you know. So it, it can be. It is the same. You need that support. And my, my wife, man, she is she's a rock star, man. She uh, she hustles every single day. And I mean, since the beginning, it's crazy. I, I sat her down on our second date and I basically I was doing jiu-jitsu competitively at that time um it was about it was august 1st i fought in october it was probably three weeks before i took my first fight and uh i sat her down was talking about jujitsu, and i was like look like i am obsessed with this i'm trying to be a world champion yada yada um it's gonna be a lot of me not being able to do stuff i don't you know i don't drink i don't do anything i don't really go out like are you cool with that because i knew she was really important to me after one date and i knew that if i if I was going to make this work, she needed to know that I don't have any vices except that and that it could turn into something good, but there's no promise to that. And then three weeks in, I, I got an offer to take a fight and I took it, uh, you know, after talking to her and we've been, we've been at it since, you know, I was working part time, almost full time when I was living in Myrtle beach, um, my first six pro fights. And then after that, we went to the UFC in Charlotte, uh, where, you know, it's not too far from where we lived in Myrtle beach. And I was going back and forth. Uh, training an hour and a half in North Carolina with John Salter, who I train with full time now. And we went, and it was so funny, man. I think just these weird little signs happen for you. We were getting ready to leave for the fights, and we went to move our hamper, and out of the corner in our apartment was like 50 roaches just crawling out. And I remember just feeling like a sack of garbage and being like, man, like I could be working at my job now. It's almost full time. You know, waiting tables at night. We could be putting money away, living in a nicer place, and all these things. And I was so humiliated and, uh, and whatever. We got that cleaned up that night. We hit the road, went to Charlotte, watched the UFC. And I was watching 
the guys that were closer to my weight class and I, we were sitting up in the nosebleeds and I was like, I looked at her and I was like, I can do this, you know? And we had dabbled with the idea of moving to Wilmington and training with uh, Salter and the guys down there. And um, it was one of those things where I came home and I told her, I told my bosses because they were really into my career. I was like, look, I'm either going to quit or I'm going to move and do this full time, but I'm not going to do this half hearted. You know, I'm going to train. I'm going to, you know, and you need to make money, but I was going to do odd jobs instead. I needed to train full time because I just needed to know, you know, win, lose, or draw. I needed to know if I could get there or not. And I believe I could, you know. And uh, yeah, she stood by me through everything, man. There's been, it's been unreal. And it's so cliche and it's so this and so that. And usually when people put out on social media how much their spouse means to them, it's usually the opposite. They're, they're projecting, you know, they're having trouble or something like that. But, um, you know, I try and pick and choose when I put out there how important to me she is. But I think the fight was the most important time because that's that contract is half hers as it is mine. You know, um, she may not be in there fighting, but gosh, she has carried the team, man. It's been unreal, and uh, just lucky to have her, man. She's been there the whole time, and hopefully now I can take over the slack and give her the light that she deserves because she doesn't really want much. She doesn't ask for much, and that's why she deserves everything. Did it ever get to that point too? Because I know you kind of you saw that crossroads. It's either go one way or or, or go the other way, you know, and obviously it comes to a point where you're like, all right, realistically, I could do this for this long, but then like, I have to put kind of a time frame on this thing. Did you set a time frame to yourself at that point? You say like, yeah. Hey, listen, if I'm not in the UFC in two or three years, like, you know, maybe I'll have to go a different direction. Like what was the, what were yeah. those conversations like? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm an idiot sometimes <laughs> with, um, with my goal setting, you know, I'm not the most confident person. Like I'm not, I don't have all this pride. I think I have dignity, but I don't have pride. I'm not like this, like boastful. I'll beat that guy. This guy, like you could put, uh, you know, a ten year old kid on the other side of the tail of the tape, and I'd be like, man, well, I saw a match and he was pretty fast. Like that's just how I live my life, you know. But when it comes to goals, I'm really hard on myself. And my idiot self set a goal to be in a big promotion by 25. Uh, I'll be 26 in a month and 10 days. So. Yeah, I wrote that down at some point in time, and we, uh, you know, I had a couple goals. One was just to move, um, to move cities, just because we wanted to live somewhere else. Because my wife had lived in Myrtle Beach her whole life. Uh, one was to, you know, save for an engagement ring and then get married, and then the other one was to be in a big promotion by 25. And when we moved, she found that book, and it was right after my 25th birthday, and I was like, oh crap, all right, time's ticking. I was gonna extend that win, lose, or draw, you know, but it was just like, wow, like okay. And then you know. Uh, when I started fighting, I had I went 3-0, all finishes. My first five amateur fights were all finishes. I was like, this is great. I'm watching the Conor McGregor documentary going, oh, man, like I'm going to do what he did. I can see it just like he did and this and that. I'm so motivated. And then I lost the first time, and I was like, oh, you know, you're not a guy that won three times. Your guy's lost once. You know, can you even do this at the highest levels, this and that? Uh, came back, won two fights, and then it'll be a year and four days from now. It'll be a year from – I got starched in front of everybody. I was winning the fight, a uh, really tough opponent. It was the two best rounds of my career up to that point. And then my legs got tired. I planted my feet for a second, and he knocked me into, you know, the shadow realm. And uh, we had a moment, you know. We had a moment in the hotel there. Um, everyone was in the room, you know, making sure they are checking on me. We were going to eat some pizza or something, uh, drown our sorrows in junk food. But uh, I went in the bathroom for a minute. And I was getting ready to hop in the shower. My wife came in, and we just sat there, and we cried together, you know, for like five minutes. And um, it was a crossroads where it's like, man, like, this is not just you. This is other people. You know, my boxing coach putting his time into me with nothing in return. I couldn't afford to pay him for the sessions. And, you know, it was just the payoff of, hey, like, hopefully I'll make some money and be able to pay you back, you know. And um, just all the people, man. And uh, that weighed on me a lot at that point. And quitting was literally every other day probably I was thinking about if I don't win this fight, I need to quit or that, you know. And um, that's really when my wife picked up the slack more than anything. Forget, you know, making sure our bills are covered and if I couldn't and all that stuff. She picked up the slack when I didn't believe anymore, you know, because it's easy to lose that confidence quick and think you're a bum or think you're just a guy that lost twice. And she picked up the slack. I would go to her and be like, hey, like, I don't think I need to quit if I lose this next fight. She'd be like, no, like, no one ever said anything about that. Why are you thinking about that? Like, I don't think you need to quit ever. You have too much left to do. And um, I think – a lot of people, whether it's friends, whether it's family, whether it's spouse, take the opposite end of that and be like, hey, man, uh, you know, how long are we going to live like this? And I think that, you know, being able to get to the UFC maybe shows that I can be one of the one or two percent of an athlete in this sport. But 
I think she's the 1% of 1% of people, you know, and um, especially in this day and age of social media and all of this and people having all these options, people, you know, it'd be so easy to walk away from someone like me that wasn't doing much with my life from the outside looking in, you know, and uh, yeah, just, I thought about quitting every single day and that never even crossed her mind. So it was team effort for sure. Would you have this road any other way? I mean, like in hindsight, I mean, hindsight's such a fickle beast. You know, you could be 11-0 and 0 and got the USC contract and it would be a really cool thing. But going through what you've gone through, going through the losses, going through the ups and downs, moving the hamper over and seeing roaches to get to this point, yeah. you know, would you have it any other way at this point? Is this, this is the no. story that was supposed yeah. to be written, right? This is exactly it, man. And uh, It's so funny. I used to have a teammate at an old gym I used to train at. And I love movies. I'm a huge movie guy. I love quote movies. I just, I love movies. And I'd always be like, oh, this is just like that movie, yada, yada. And he'd be like, hey, man, life's not a movie. And I would always fire back in the same thing. I'd say, your life's not a movie, you know? And I think the second you stop believing you can make these things happen, they stop happening, you know? And um, my road wasn't easy in jiu-jitsu growing up, you know? It all played out something that wasn't real. You know, I was sneaking away to drive four hours with my teammates. I was the oldest. It was me, my buddy Andrew Richardson, who trains the team Alpha Mountain. He's a good pro. And then uh, our buddy John Battle, who's a good jiu-jitsu competitor. And I was the oldest out of the three of us. I, was, I just got my license. I was 17. And I'm sneaking away. Instead of sneaking to parties and stuff, we're sneaking to drive from Jersey to Virginia to compete. Without my parents finding out, I had an extra person in the car that I shouldn't have had. Uh, <laughs> one. And, you know, everything's been like that. I wouldn't want it any other way, man. I've never been a guy with great skill off the bat. You know, I think I learn quickly and I work hard. But it would it would be it'd be ludicrous for me to have gone nine and zero and get signed to the UFC and just have this natural progression to the top. That wouldn't be me, you know. And I think uh, I grew up on Rocky. I grew up watching movies like that and Vision Quest and all these things where the the up and down and up and down. And I wouldn't want my life any other way, man. Now I hope it's a lot of ups, but. Um, you know, I want to be able to inspire people. I want to be able to motivate people because I think people see that I'm just like some regular guy. You know, I'm not some freak athlete. And, you know, I think I'm an okay athlete. And I work hard and I become a better athlete. But I'm not some natural talent, man. I think people can relate to that. And down the long run, that's going to let me relate to more people, whether I can go speak at school. Uh-oh. Jiu-jitsu and training, and my old instructor was the same way, so I followed his example. Well, I could be that example now, and hopefully I can do good enough where it can show them what you can do with that, you know? And if I was just some freak talent like a John Jones or, a, you know, someone like that, people chalk it up to, well, he's John Jones. I could never do that. For some reason, and I'm glad they do, people look at me and are like, well, I can do what he's doing, you know? And that's how it should be. That's, that's exactly how I want my life to go, man. I want to be the everyday man, the blue-collar guy out there hustling and grinding every single day. So now that you've cleared this hurdle, you're in the UFC, in a perfect world, when would you like to make your debut? Is there is there any card that's on the schedule right now? You're like, yep, I want to I want to be on that one. Yeah, I love um, I love boxing, man. I, love, I mean, I'm a jiu-jitsu guy at heart, but I love watching old boxing fights. It's so funny. I send my teammates clips of like black and white fights. I'm like, look at the technique here. You know, I'm 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 a nut with that. I love watching old fights like that. And where, where's the bigger old school boxing place in Madison Square Garden? You know, I'm from New Jersey, not North Jersey, South. So Philly would be cool, but that's not coming up. Um, man, growing up, that's what it's all about, you know. And uh, I would love to fight on that Madison Square Garden card. I said it in the post-fight interview is that would be awesome. But I've been fighting in the same places, Philly, Atlantic City, and South and North Carolina. Anywhere the UFC goes is somewhere I've never seen, I'm sure. Or even if I go to Vegas, at least I'll get to fight in Team Oval this time. So any of those cards would be amazing, man. Beggars can't be choosers. But in a perfect world, man, the first movie's over. It ends with me, rah, rah, in a Dana White Contender Series. And the second one starts out me training for a Madison Square Garden debut and being the hero there and bringing all my, my family, my team, and everybody there would be unreal. But, hey, whatever they got, I'm ready to go. You know what? Boston's not too far away from, yeah. from New York, and that would be a lot of fun UFC. too. That's the first UFC. I've only been to two UFCs, and one was with my 17th birthday. Grappler's Quest Tournament, Fan Expo, all that was at the UFC. So we did that. That night went to the UFC. And oddly enough, my coach now, John Salter, fought there. He was my age at the time. And uh, he fought Dan Miller. And I'm from New Jersey. I didn't. I was not going to root for some guy from Alabama who was a wrestler. <laughs> you know, I always lost to wrestlers. I'm not going to root for a wrestler from the South. I'm rooting for the Jersey guy that goes for submissions, you know. And uh, full circle, now that's my coach, you know, and uh, – that's the only UFC I went to before last year. So I would love to fight in Boston too. Boston's a great fighting city and 
man, any of these big cities with history, I'm down. It'd be amazing. Do you have an opponent in mind? Is there anyone in that loaded division right now that you can, you know, see yourself getting in there for your debut? Uh, realistically, I mean, obviously you're not going to, you know, fight for the belt right now, but yeah. and you know that, but is there anybody yeah. you're looking at in that division be like, oh, that'd be a fun one to debut with? Yeah, we're not worried about those guys. I don't want to... <laughs> I don't want Khabib to know I exist. Hopefully he's retired. <laughs> I think he's had two more fights, so I should be good. But um, no, you know, there's guys that are coming off the contender series or even last season. I, you know, I have my eye on people that I think might be good matchups or tough matchups. But no, I'm not all worried about that, man. Because you know what? It's so funny. You get these things in your mind and they come up with some guy you never heard of or the guy that you didn't think about. And I'm not worried about any of that, man. I'm really trying to get this experience, get these wins, and slowly creep my way to the top 15 so that when I get there, you know, like I said, um, maybe a couple of years ago, getting here would have been a win or getting a win here would have been a win. But now I really do believe in my heart of hearts here that uh, I can be one of the best in the world one day. And uh, I think the way to do that is slow and steady and just take what they give and whatever the UFC says. And I think from the reactions I've gotten and, the, um, you know, the good publicity that even the UFC gave me, like with uh, they gave me an interview, interview at UFC.com yesterday and all this stuff. I'm thinking maybe they see that potential, too. And, um, you know, they usually – Work those guys the way we should be worked, which is good challenges at the right times and just getting that, that big challenge to really step up to the plate and show what I can do. I know anybody in this division in the UFC is going to be a challenge, and that's what I want, and that's what I need to get better. So anybody's going to be good, man. I know we've been talking for a while, and, and I appreciate your patience and, and hanging on here. Oh, but you know, since you're, we've learned that you're a true student of the game, you've, you went to Blockbuster to rent videos. <laughs> Seeing what Uriah Faber did on Saturday, kind of turning back the clock and picking up a big win over a really tough guy, up and comer in Ricky Simone, you know, seeing that, you know, being a purist of, of the sport and of the martial arts, seeing what Uriah Faber did, what was that like for you? Oh, it was awesome, man. Yeah, I caught the highlights um, and it was absolutely incredible. You know, like I said, my buddy trains out there and he's always talking about what a great guy Uriah Faber is and how much, you know, he's just, his energy is contagious in the gym. He's always inviting me out. I never been able to afford to fly out to California for a week, but uh, you know maybe soon on like a training trip to go to go visit my buddy out there and, and see them. But man, just unreal! It's so great to see one of the good guys coming back on his terms, getting the win, looking like he didn't miss a beat. You can't you can't beat that man from the WEC to the UFC. That guy's fought everybody. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of all of those guys from that generation, and I mean he's from our generation too because he's still smashing guys. So yeah, it was <laughs> awesome. Joe Selecki joining us on the program, one of the newest members of the UFC's lightweight division. Great chat with you, Joe. Before we get out of here, let the folks know where they can follow you on this new journey of yours via social yeah. media, any shout outs, anything else you want to get off your chest, the floor is yours. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm on social media. I'm on Facebook as my name, but that's oddly enough, that is kind of filling up fast. I've gotten like, I've been accepting everybody that adds me, but um, I think you've run out of room and I'm almost there, I think. Um, but I have a fan page on there, uh, Joe Selecki MMA. And I am trying to post on there more. Keep my fighting stuff on there, my personal stuff, and my personal page. I think that'll be best. Um, on Instagram, I'm just at Joe Selecki. And uh, Twitter, I don't really use. I go on there every UFC fight night to watch the fights. But maybe now I'll try and tweet out some thoughts on the fights <laughs> if anybody cares. I have like 300 followers. It's no big deal. My wife got a lot of love on Twitter and some hate from the other night, which I thought was hilarious. They were uh, <laughs> Someone was like, oh, she's just happy. She doesn't have to pay all the bills anymore. I was dying at that <laughs> one. And then uh, – Somebody else said, um, I'm a huge Eddie Alvarez fan, so this is actually a compliment. Someone was like, I thought uh, when Alvarez left the UFC, the era of Screaming Wife was over. I don't want Selecki in the UFC because it may have just begun. And I was dying at that. But, uh, yeah, I'm usually just Instagram and Facebook, but I'll post something on Twitter here or there. Uh, yeah, I just want to shout out. Thanks for having me on, man. Flow Combat's awesome. I always follow everything that you guys do. Um, just my team, man. I've been long-winded in some of the interviews, so I'll keep it short. But, man, I couldn't do it without these guys. Um, right now, I'm at Fitness Edge MMA in Myrtle Beach. I train here twice a week. This is my home gym before I left Myrtle Beach, and it's still home for me, man. We got guys coming out of here. Uh, we have Tomar Washington, who just won the King of the Cage heavyweight title. Um, and people don't know this. He posted it on social media, so they know now. But he was diagnosed with cancer like six weeks before that fight, and he fought. Wow. And he won by knockout. Yeah, he had it in his kidney. He had his kidney removed right after the fight. He's on the men. I'm sure he's going to be defending that belt pretty soon here when he's better. Um, crazy, man. We got Cody Jones out of here. He fought in Bellator. Um He's going to be back for sure, man. He's he's fighting, staying active. Jordan Weeks, Clifton Davis, all those guys. Mike Kelly, the owner of the gym, he's great. Uh, he flew out to watch the fight. He was training at the PI, working with a strength and conditioning coach there, so he could bring that back for us. Uh, can't thank these guys enough, man. My boxing coach is something out of a movie, man. He's the best. Uh, one of my best friends in the world. He believes in me through and through. We haven't even scratched the surface on what we can do, and 
uh, he's one of the main reasons I'm still fighting because he saw what I could be, much like my wife did. He always said the same thing. He never talked about our sessions now. He just talked about how much better we were going to get. And uh, we're back to work together, and it's going to be great. John Salter, uh, I couldn't do it without him and Corey Crumpler, man. They are the head guys down at Salty Dog Jiu-Jitsu in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, man, they are mean dudes when you're training, and they're two of the nicest guys in the world when you're not. They're like mean big brothers, bro. They just beat me up and make me feel like I shouldn't have a UFC contract. And, um, you know, John's coming for that belt in Bellator, you know, very, very soon. I think he should get the shot at Lovato next, but who am I to call that? And then uh, Corey is going to be fighting real soon. He's a 1-0 pro. He's been on hiatus for three years or four years. And, uh, man, there's no doubt in my mind he could be top 15 in the UFC, top guy in Bellator, as is. Um, so be on the lookout for those guys, man. Everybody that's all dog jiu-jitsu. And uh, I really want to thank the guys at Jim O in Charlotte. Uh, Jeff Jim O is an absolute genius, man. There's... It's a little hub outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, in Gastonia. Uh, the stuff they're doing inside that little gym is special, man. And it's uh, a little dark room with just tough dudes. We've got um, – there's a couple guys out of there in the UFC. you got Brian Barberina and Scott Holtzman. And then we have uh, – Impa is going to be on the Contender Series coming up August 27th. He's been fighting two years. He's 5-0 as a pro on the Contender Series. Unreal. Crazy. Um, I really want to thank those guys, man. They've been fantastic. And uh, – that was a huge missing piece in our training camp for me and, and for John. We've been going up there a lot. And uh, I've been spending, you know, two days a week at my home base in Wilmington, two days a week in Myrtle Beach, Charlotte two days a week, which is about four hours away, and then back for the last day of the week back in Wilmington. So um, it's just been this weird puzzle pieces that I think finally formulated together, man. I can't thank them enough. And I got to thank my wife. Unreal, man. I love her to death. She hears this every single day. Um Sometimes she's not a morning person, so sometimes I'll tell her that in the morning and she'll shoot me away. But, um, yeah, I couldn't do it without her. She knows that. And uh, I got to thank my dogs. They don't watch They don't watch <laughs> combat. But, man, I do all these interviews, man. We don't have kids yet, you know. We have two – I mean, they're like kids. But uh, we have two dogs. I never shout them out, man. So I want to thank everybody, just everybody that loves and supports me. I love them back, and uh, I'm just – Man, I've been blessed. It's great. Thanks Ma- for having me, man. Making history here. Shouting out the dogs. <laughs> I love it, man. Uh <laughs> Really great stuff, Joe. I, I appreciate you opening up and, and talking about everything. It was, it was awesome. And I always believe that the best interviews are not interviews at all. Uh, I yeah. don't feel like this is an interview. I think we were just just two guys having a conversation. I think that's the best way to do it. So all the best to you. Uh, we look forward to, you, to seeing you in the Octagon soon, hopefully up here in, in Massachusetts. Absolutely, man. Sounds great. Thanks so much.